All right, so the last time we talked about solids and how they are characterized by crystal structure, density, and elasticity. Now we're going to talk about compression and tension, which is how forces act on solids. And we're also going to talk about scaling. So you scale up dimensions and volume and surface area changes. First off is compression and tension. So you have a horizontal beam. Horizontal is sideways, right? Horizontal beam supported at one or both ends. So even imagine, take your pencil, hold it at one end. You now have a horizontal beam supported at one end. It's under stress from the load it supports. So let's say I hang my key ring on the end of my pencil that I'm holding. Okay, it now has a load on it, including its own weight. So even without the keys on it, it still has a weight pulling down. It undergoes a stress of compression and tension. Tension is stretching, compression is squishing. All right, so what we're going to talk about a lot is steel. It's a really good elastic material. You may be thinking, that's a metal, how's that elastic? But if you bend steel, it'll bend back without being deformed. It can be stretched and compressed. So we use it to make springs, right? So springs spring back really well, made out of steel. And also construction girders, things that um, things are built out of. So if you have them vertical, you stand them straight on their end, nothing really happens. There's not a whole lot of compression or anything. What really happens is when you turn it sideways, horizontally, and it might sag under a heavy load because of its weight and the load. So here's our steel girder. Attached at this end with a load at this end, and it's got its own weight on it. So the top part is stretched, the bottom part is compressed. So you see how the top here, it's kind of pulled both ways. So it's stretched out and in here it's being squished in in the middle. So that's our compression and our tension. The middle portion is neither stretched nor compressed. Nothing happens right in the middle. Um, this is called a cantilever beam. So that's just a vocab term to know. So in that beam we just saw, the top part, top part stretched. Atoms are pulled away from one another. It's slightly longer than the bottom part or the middle. The bottom part is compressed, things are pushed together, the atoms are shoved closer to each other, so the bottom part is slightly shorter. And then in the middle we have that area where nothing's really happening, that is our neutral layer. Here's another one, supported at both ends with a load in the middle, okay? The top part's compressed, it's squished in both ways, and the bottom part is stretched, it's being pulled to one end or the other. Top part's in compression, bottom part is in tension. We still have that neutral layer in the middle. All right, so I-beams, we use I-beams a lot in construction. They look like an eye, obviously, like you can see. So they just take out that middle section, so you lose a lot of weight, but they have the same amount of strength due to physics. So the stress is pretty much in those top and bottom pieces. Um, one will get stretched and the other will get compressed. Um, the middle one is that neutral layer, so nothing really happens in the middle section. If you have a heavier load, you get a taller middle section. Alright, so let's think. Tree branch. You could make a hole at the top, middle, or bottom of it. Which one would weaken it the least? The answer is the middle, right? The neutral layer. So if you put it in the top, it'll break from the top. If you put it in the bottom, it'll crush in at the bottom. But if you put it in the middle, Nothing's being stretched or, or compressed there, so it will weaken it least. How's the horizontal beam affected by the load it supports? Um, it is either stretched or compressed, either compression or tension. And then that neutral layer in the middle. Okay, scaling. We're going to talk about a lot of examples of scaling. What scaling is, is when you increase your length, width, or height, those are your linear dimensions. <clears throat> the cross-sectional area, you cut it straight through and look at the area of a slice of it. And the surface area, the area covering the surface of the object, increases by the multiplier of the dimensions squared. So if I multiplied the length, width, and height by 2, my cross-sectional area and surface area increases by 2 squared. 
whereas volume and weight increase as the cube of the multiplier, so it would increase by 2 cubed. Volume therefore grows faster than surface area because it goes up by the cube and not the square. So volume will get bigger faster. So an ant can carry several ants on its back, but a strong elephant could not carry one elephant on its back. So let's say, let's think about that. If you take an ant, you turn it into the size of an elephant, would it be several times stronger than an elephant because it can carry several ants? No, because it actually wouldn't even be able to stand up because its legs would be too thin and they would break. So elephants are still stronger, but proportionally it's different. So the proportions of things in nature are in accord with their size. And the study of how size affects the relationship between weight, strength, and surface area is known as scaling. As the size of something increases, it gets heavier much faster than it gets stronger. So you, as you're scaling up that ant, it gets heavier faster than it gets stronger, so it's not able to hold itself up. Weight depends on volume, right? So more mass in a certain space, you get uh, more weight. And strength depends on the cross-sectional area of limbs. So a big tree trunk will hold up a big tree. You have a tiny tree trunk, and it's going to hold up a small tree, right? That's strength. So here's our examples of um, how the dimensions are multiplied by some number, the area goes up by the square, and the volume and weight go up by the cube. So we start off with a 1 by 1. We multiply everything by 2, so it's now a 2 by 2 by 2. Our area was 1 centimeter squared. Now it, it was multiplied by 2, and 2 squared is 4, so our cross-sectional area is 4 centimeters squared and the volume goes up by 2 cubed, so it's 8 centimeters cubed. Right, so on and so forth. Multiply by 3. 3 squared is 9, so 9 times 1 is 9. And 3 cubed is 27, so 27 times 1 is 27. Or 4. Uh, 4 squared is 16, so our cross-sectional area is 16. And 4 cubed is 64, so our volume is 64. So you take the original one, the multiplier, square or cubit and multiply that times the original cross-sectional area or volume. Alright, consider an athlete who can w lift his weight with one arm. Okay, consider the strongest person at our school, they can lift their whole weight with one arm. They're crazy strong. Now we make them twice as big. What happens? They're twice as big. Their arms are twice as thick. They have four times the cross-sectional area. Right, it goes up by two squared. So he would be four times as strong. However, the volume would be eight times as great because two cubed is eight. So it would be eight times the volume. So he would be eight times as heavy. So even though he's four times as strong, he's eight times as heavy. So now he could only lift half his weight. So in relation to his weight, he's actually weaker than before. Weight grows as the cube of the linear enlargement, and strength grows as the square. So that's the math you need to remember for this section. Weight goes up by the cube, strength goes up as the square. So you have thick legs of large animals like elephants in comparison to small animals. So an elephant or a deer, deer have skinny legs. A tarantula has thick legs, it's got a heavy body. Or daddy long legs, they've got tiny body, tiny legs. So we have a cube one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. We make it 10 by 10 by 10. What's the volume? What's the cross-sectional surface area? And what is its total surface area? Volume goes up by 10 cubed. So it is 1,000 times 1. Gives us 1,000 centimeters cubed. The cross-sectional surface area goes up by 10 squared which is 100, so 100 times the original one was 1, so now it's 100. And then the total surface area, there are 6 sides to a cube, so you take the cross section and multiply by 6.
that's all it is. Alright, so if you double the linear dimensions of an object by how much will the cross-sectional area grow? It goes up by the square, so it will go up by 4, which is 2 squared. How scaling affects surface area versus volume. So how does surface area compare with volume? Volume goes up with the cube, surface area grows up as, as the square. So as something grows, it gets more volume faster than surface area. So in the end, you're going to get more volume and less surface area. It'll keep getting distance and distance and distance from each other. So think of it this way. Smaller objects have more surface area per kilogram. Smaller, you get more surface area um, with a small amount of mass. Now if you get a bigger object, you get uh, less surface area per kilogram of mass. So if you have cooling occurs at the surfaces, so if you have crushed ice, the same mass as an ice cube, the crushed ice will cool the drink faster than a single ice cube because the crushed ice has more surface area per kilogram than the ice cube does. Crushed ice has that more surface area to present. Also, the rusting of iron occurs at the surface. So if you have more surface exposed, rusting takes place faster. So small filings in steel wool um, get eaten up because they have a lot of surface area. Whereas if you have a solid cube of iron, it won't rust a whole lot in comparison. Some more examples. Chunks of coal burn while coal dust explodes. Thin french fries cook faster than fat french fries. Flat hamburgers cook faster than meatballs. Large raindrops fall faster than small raindrops. Right, so it's that surface area to volume. More volume, less surface area as you continue to grow. But if you change it so that you get more surface area for the same, um, for the same amount of mass, then you will get uh, either heat distribution better or less rusting or whatever it might be. Alright, how does scaling affect living organisms? Elephants have giant ears, right? And it has nothing to do with their hearing but for better cooling. Elephants are massive, right? They have a huge amount of mass. And so they generate heat proportional to their mass. So a giant elephant generates a lot more heat than a small elephant. But the heat it can give off, right? Like we sweat, things like that we give off or get rid of heat is proportional to the amount of surface area it has. So those ears don't take up a whole lot more mass, but they give a lot more surface area. And so they're able to cool off better. So there's our elephant with his big old ears. More surface area because he has those ears. Better cooling. Another one, air resistance. Depends on the surface area of the moving object. If you fall off a cliff, even with air resistance, you're going to continue to increase your speed until you hit that terminal velocity, unless you have a parachute which gives you more surface area. Right, so you're going to go really fast because your proportion of surface area to volume will be very different. Now let's say a small animal doesn't need a parachute. They have lots and lots of surface area in comparison to the fact that they don't weigh a whole lot. So you can drop an insect from the top of a tree and he will be just fine. Another example, the rate of a heartbeat in a mammal is related to its size. So the heart of a shrew beats 20 times as fast as the heart of an elephant. So small mammals live fast, die young, and larger animals live at a leisurely pace and live longer. So that's just another scaling aspect. Alright, so again, if the linear dimensions double, by how much will the volume grow? Volume goes up by the cube of an object, so 2 cubed is 8, it will increase by 8. That's all for this section. Be sure to read chapter 18 in your textbook.